Okay, so you've got another historian here. Sorry about that. And I'm going to pull you back even a bit more. So it may seem a little bit maybe more theoretical or more remote if we look at sort of the long trajectory of the Christian Middle Ages. Now, interrupt with questions, anything like this. But I think what I have to say is going to be particularly interesting, both as a sort of long-term background to what the guys who wrote the First Amendment were thinking with the Establishment and Free Exercise Clauses, and also um, kind of on a more immediate level about the kind of slow bleeding of religious institutions into the state of sort of, um, because what I'm talking about here is this sort of very long-term trajectory where Christian religious courts begin as something like institutions of alternative dispute resolution and harden into a very powerful, very effective, very popular parallel justice system. Uh, and the period I study exactly, usually 16th century, 17th century, is the period when European states are starting to try to kind of push back against the, um, the system of Christian religious courts. Now, there are a couple of interesting resonances already with what was mentioned earlier. So when Michael was talking about anti-Sharia law 1.0 and anti-Sharia law 2.0, it reminded me very much of a set of three statutes that were passed in 14th century England called Premunire. And they said that basically you can't try, you can't appeal a court case alibi elsewhere. What they meant was you shouldn't be able to appeal cases either from a royal court but particularly from a church court to Rome. Now what's interesting by the late 15th century, early 16th century, even before the English Reformation, this word alibi is taken to mean you can't sort of take your case to a church court within England. So if the local royal officials or judges choose to prevent you from taking a course there, a case there, uh, they simply issue a writ of premunire. Um, now, there are also some other um, contemporary things in France and elsewhere about the content of the law versus its form, uh, and particularly about marriage, but I won't go too much into this, but turns out that right in the modern Catholic Church, sort of marriage seems adamantine and unbreakable, but it turns out in the middle of the 16th century, the, one of the church councils basically kind of decided, well, we can kind of change things a little bit. As long as we don't touch the, the kind of the substance of the sacrament of marriage, we can change how it happens, right? You know, um, we can sort of shift things a little bit. And I think this is a little bit of what's going on with um, sort of religious divorces in Judaism. Now, the reason I um, want to talk about this project is I'm currently finishing up a book on church courts and credit in late medieval Europe, specifically on the excommunication of debtors. Um, and this is a particularly sort of interesting window into these problems of religion in the public square because um, there are some very serious consequences, I think, both for the religious institution, the Catholic Church, and for the lay polities of Europe when you start allowing litigants to either litigate their, courses before, their cases before a church court or to secure obligations on pain of damnation. Um, now, I'm also interested in this because I'm currently living in Germany, which provides a very different perspective than from the US. I've also lived in France for a considerable time, which as you might remember is a lay republic, not an agnostic republic, not a, you know, um, you still get Pentecost Monday off, right? These sort of movable religious holidays. Similarly in Germany, right? Easter, which moves around as a, I think, a federation-wide holiday. Um, anyway, so where we begin with this um, is really kind of the transition of church courts from institutions of ADR to, um, to a parallel justice system. So this is where I'm going to begin. Then I'm going to talk about sort of the ideal of conciliation within these church courts, right? This may not be such a terrible thing. This also might explain why litigants or at least contractants might have been attracted to them and their sanction. And then the third part, I just want to talk specifically about excommunication for debt briefly and then offer some conclusions. So stop me if anything seems unclear or I go too fast. Um, it's in the Gospel of Matthew that the duty of each Christian to correct another is established. And uh, the authorized version, it's a bit clunky, but I'll use it. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he shall not hear thee, 
then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word shall be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, or assembly. Because everything really kind of hinges upon the sense that you give to that last word, ecclesia in Greek, right? The assembly or the church, to take a more sort of high church kind of modern vision of it. Um, and it's quite clear that at the beginning this is about the assembly of Christian believers, right? It's a very informal thing. Um, you can see in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, there is a sort of lament that brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers, right? Lamenting the fact that Christians are taking their cases to Roman civil courts. Um, but what's really interesting is that over the fourth century, the place of the Christian church in Roman society shifts momentously. There's nothing else to say. Um, Peter Brown, um, famous scholar of late antiquity, put this best, I think, once um, when I was listening to him. Um, the shift between the Emperor Constantine I, who um, legalized the Christian faith in 313, and between the Emperor the Theodosius I, who died in 394, who made Christianity the empire's official religion in 380, is a little bit like um, ways of imagine, imagining the coverage of Starbucks across the world. So for Constantine, Christian universalism, um, it's like a map of the world colored green, right? It's not that everyone in China drinks coffee, it's that coffee is legally available there. Maybe there's only one coffee shop, who knows? Um, for Theodosius, um, it's really, um, it's more that everybody drinks and should drink coffee. In fact, the text of his law um, basically says those insane people who refuse are going to be forced to drink coffee, more or less, or lose their civil rights. Um, Theodosius' edict, by the way, is put as the first, um, the first entry in the um, Just, Justinian, a later um, Byzantine emperor's con um, codification of administrative law. It's hugely influential. Um, so the sanction remains the same. Um, exclusion from the community and from the celebrations or sacraments that unify it. But from the fourth century onwards, particularly from Theodosius onwards, it's going to be tied to judicial procedures in bishops' courts. So what's happening, right, is we're seeing the assimilation of the community of Christian believers into the political, with the political legal community. So by the fifth century, these overseers, these episcopoi um, of these assemblies, bishops, um, were judges and arbiters often with formally delegated powers from the Roman government. Late Roman law gave bishops competence over the clergy and church property, certainly right to supervise schools and the care of prisoners, the right to challenge the decisions of imperial officials, and to appeal to the emperor against them, and the right to hear cases by delegation. So this tends to judicialize the functions of the late antique, it's called the Episcopalis Audientia, the bishop's court, which is a judicial body, but also other things in the sense of kind of you can think of a medieval king or prince's court. Um, now, I guess one way you could look at this is that a bit of the stateness of the Christianized late Roman state sort of rubs off on the church. Now, subsequent to this, sixth century onwards, um, this transfer of judicial and arbitrative functions to bishops continues. Bishops assume further administrative and judicial functions from the late antique state. Um, for instance, as the Roman system of taxation collapsed, church estates preserved the administrative methods, um, sort of administrative tax rolls for estates that marked them out as what's been called fragments of the state. Uh, that many of the bishops in the Western Empire were of senatorial families aided this transition. You can think probably of Sidonius Apollinaris or Gregory of Tours. Um, so on that side, the kind of delegation of or usurpation of civil power by bishops in the church um, we still see this today. Um, the Bishop of Andorra is still co-prince, right? Um, in England, the Bishop of Durham was the kind of Count Palatine of his little principality until 1836, uh, the Holy Roman Empire. Bishops were sort of ruling as secular princes until 1803. France, someplace until 1789. Okay. Now, what I would say is that, in some sense, these kind of princely bishops nevertheless still fulfilled the injunctions of the gospel. Um, by encouraging the peaceful settlement of disputes. Uh, in the centuries on either side of the millennium, you see something really sort of remarkable when you look at the texts of legal disputes. Um, you see the record being shaped to hide any, um, anything but amicable concord. You want to hide any coercion. 
Um, in the words of one of the historians of this, the restitution of a usurped property becomes a donation. The abandonment of illegitimate claims becomes an act of piety. The admission of guilt becomes an act of hum humility. Punishment becomes a penance. Um, so bishops are kind of doubly mediators. They emulate the merciful Christ and mobilize their worldly status. Um, but basically by kind of grabbing a little bit of the aura of divine power um, and sort of placing it on their decisions. Now, they mediate even more after the millennium with the decline of public assemblies and other institutions. Um, what happens after that is that these fragments of the late antique state sort of regrow their bureaucratic, judicial, and legalistic carapace, um, in large part in response to demand. Uh, demand for the resolution of disputes, but also, importantly for me, for the um, yeah, ratification of contracts. Was it all, always before a single arbitrator, such as the bishop, or was there a delegated tri triumvirate? So this is what I'm, uh, th what is coming up here is that initially it happens sort of in the bishop's court, and there usually he might have choir bishops early on, or archdeacons, or sort of other clerics sitting around, and maybe some of the big men of the area. But by the time we start to get routinized ratification of contracts, 12th century, particularly 13th century, bishops all across Europe are delegating their judging functions to um, what would you say, kind of professional judges who are called are officials. Really, yeah. always a single, a single arbiter, so to speak? Um, no. I mean, in most cases, it's a single arbiter. I mean, you can go to, but there are often panels of auditors who sit on this, like the current, the Roman Rota in Rome, the sort of Supreme Court of Appeal sits with a, I mean, nor, normally two or three, I think, at least. And is it clear what type of law they will be applying, right? That is to say, uh, right, you know, so a litigant can say, well, I can go here or I can go here. Right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, like a follow-up question would yeah. be, what's the relationship of the various... Uh, law, you know, law, a positive law, yes. as it comes out, once, once, once judges are aware of the form shopping. Yes. Um, so there are a couple of, I think, points I should make. I was trying to bracket some of this. So as to the first point of what law, um, well, around the millennium, the sort of this prospect, this kind of project of church reform leads to this codification of canon law, the law of the church. Um, and it really drives a sort of intellectual elaboration, right? This is sort of Gratian is this man who puts together, puts together this teaching text. It's not a formal codification, but it's for teaching. It's trying to systematize law. So we get a much more kind of learned construct of the church's law, which was rather more inchoate up to that point. Now, as for forum shopping, turns out, and I'll get to this in a little bit of the exact text, but that canon law is actually much more flexible than secular laws all across Europe. Um, in the earlier period, I mean, I won't say much, but basically by the high Middle Ages, 13th, 14th century, most secular courts um, have very high court costs, have very high burdens of proof, and they want written documents, right, for a contract that may, you know, they want you to have a notary, which is very expensive, and they want much better proof. Uh, the church court um, will, in fact, go on verbal proof. Court costs are very low, and, in fact, sometimes most of the excommunications I find are simple, simple kind of procedural excommunications. There was failure to respond to a summons or failure to um, comply with a warning to pay. There's very little actual sort of kind of litigation, right, argument about sort of the details of the case in, course, in court. So what I'd say is by 1300, the church really possesses a system of justice parallel to and in many ways superior, particularly for the navigation, the enforcement of contracts to that administered by lords and kings. Um, and just, I think I would say, to sum up, um, when you look at high medieval commentaries on that passage from the Gospel of Matthew I began with, um, you find out that they're no longer talking about the assembly. When one of them, Nicholas of Lyra, a 14th century commentator, um, comments on the thing about denounce sinners unto the ecclesia, he says, that is, to the, pre to the prelate through public denunciation. So um, what had formerly been a kind of fraternal correction sort of leading towards a kind of informal dispute resolution kind of initiates judicial procedures. Um, and in addition, uh, Lyra adds um, about the end that if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican, he says,
That is, be he cast out from other believers through excommunication and ecclesiastical censure. So, right, this is not kind of shunning within the community, but it's now simply the response to disobedience to the church court, which is, in fact, you know, staffed by lawyers, has professional judges. Um, but I still say that this often leads to conciliation. Um, one of my smaller arguments here is that historians have for too long focused on the oppressive activity of church courts with respect to marriage and to sexuality or to heresy. This isn't to say they didn't have sort of repressive effects on um, sexuality or, her or on heretics, um, but that this sort of dark view of the activity of medieval church courts um, neglects how um, even after bishops' conciliating functions have been transferred to bureau bureaucratized tribunals, um, contractants and litigants really sort of went to church courts um, rather eagerly, right? There's great demand, and this is really what is driving this kind of bureaucratization of church courts. Um, so the second point I guess I would say is how could these offer inducements toward the amicable resolution of disputes? And I think basically the clearest answer is that this happens through the sort of nuclear option, right? Sort of you comply with what the court says or you are going to hell. Um, so, I mean, this is sort of, that, that is kind of the harsh end of this rhetoric of conciliation. Um, but the whole point of the threat of damnation is to encourage kind of conciliation and negotiation. Uh, you find it elsewhere than in canon law in the Middle Ages, even in secular courts where you would expect sort of the most, I think, tenacious contentiousness, um, you find out as today that most civil litigation is abandoned um, before it comes to a final judgment. Um, and in fact, you might say the, in the initiation of an act of a kind of a legal procedure, a trial, is as much an inducement to compromise as it is a threat to pursue the law to its conclusion. Um, so if you look at the rhetoric, again here we kind of have coercion sort of being bracketed from the record. So one of the courts I study, a secular court, and I'll turn to church courts again, the Parliament of Paris, which is like a um, supreme court for much of northern France, recorded amicable agreements in cases pending before it from the Middle Ages until the 17th century. These accords emphasized the litigants' unanimous agreement. Um, one of my favorites from 1493 says, basically, and it speaks in the name of the king because this is the king's justice, by the permission and authority of our Court of Parliament, a certain pending case has been unanimously and with complete agreement discussed, treated, agreed, and pacified as in the letters of transaction and accord. Which accord and everything generally and specifically contained, specified, and declared in it, our aforesaid court has sentenced and sentences in judgment to be heeded, obeyed, complied with, and observed unwaveringly and inviolably by the aforesaid parties as if it were a judgment of our same court permitting the parties to cease litigation without penalty or court costs. Okay, that's a lot of kind of medieval legal jargon. I mean, we've heard this before. But I'd say what is happening here and what's important to highlight with respect to my kind of overall theme is that this kind of rhetoric of conciliation, of negotiation within the community of believers, which has now been kind of spread to the political community, is in fact appearing, right? This is sort of, and it's heavily pushed by judges. Litigants know that this is how this works and it's apparent in how they argue cases and how they agree cases. Um, you can find this down even at the village level. So this rhetoric of kind of, of concord, um, one of the other cases I've looked at is a dispute between a monastery and its serfs in the part of France between kind of Burgundy and where they make Chablis. Um, and there is a royal tax official who's ratifying an agreement um, in a dispute this dispute with the serfs, and the, the, the ratification goes, because there were assorted suits initiated and to be initiated in the diverse courts between the said inhabitants and the venerable monks, abbot, and convent of Saint-Michel, concerning the villagers' status as serfs as well as the amount and nature of their dues to the abbey, the said inhabitants were in great vexation, litigation, and dispute with the said monks, their lords, whose possessions were dilapidated and nearly destroyed, to remedy such evils, litigation, and misfortunes and so as to live in peace and avoid lawsuits and court expenses, they have today transacted, made peace, and agreed on the following matters and others hereafter declared with the said monks. So we have this rhetoric of conciliation, but here it's pretty clear 
that what is going on is some form of coercion by the abbey on its serfs. Um, they actually get their personal freedom. The abbot later um, argues that their tenures are servile. So there's more litigation about that. I think he either had the main villagers beaten up or threatened to pull their leases. Um, in any case, right, so this sort of, this ideal of conciliation within the body of believers kind of spreads outward from the church. Um, now, to return to church courts, I, um, I will skip forward a little bit and talk about um, the type of obligation that drove the expansion of church courts in this period. Because here again, you can see this rhetoric of conciliation in operation. Don't worry, I'll get to the dark part at the end of this talk. Um, so these bureaucratized church courts of the high middle ages use excommunication, exclusion from the sacraments that united the Christian community and guaranteed believers a chance at salvation to enforce respect um, for their procedures. Those who refused to comply with the commands of ecclesiastical justice to reconcile with their fellow believers were justly to be excommunicated from the community. And so here's where we get the letters of Nisi, um, which is the type of contract that drove the bureaucratization of church courts. They're so called for the Latin word for the clause providing for the automatic excommunication of the debtor if Nisi, if he fails to pay up. So French formulary, for instance, of 1500 says, uh, unless the borrower should satisfy his creditor with the specified sum or a payment plan within the specified term, he shall be by us and by our authority excommunicated with no other prior warning. So what this letter does is it kind of short circuits the potentially cumbrous procedure of um, church courts, um, secular courts certainly as well. Um, like binding arbitration agreements, they're intended to keep contractants in line. Um, for creditors, letters of Nisi were desirable as they secured a debt very cheaply with a very powerful sanction. However, as notaries spread across Europe and the use of um, private written contracts spread or books of account, things like this, letters of Nisi were less and less used. Um, so even, and yet, so even as the use of these kind of written contracts um, declines, church courts nevertheless preserve jurisdiction over contracts even those not initially ratified in church courts. So I'll give you two reasons for why. The first one is a kind of cultural one, and then the second one is the legal one. Uh, the first one, I just would like to cite an example from 16th century London. Uh, in 1529, a woman named Johanna Carpenter of the parish of St. Mary Queenith seized the arm of her neighbor, Margaret Chamber, with whom she was at odds over some matter, as Mistress Chamber knelt waiting her turn to receive her Easter communion. I pray you let me speak a word with you, she said, for you have need to ask me forgiveness before you receive your rights. So she's preventing her from making Easter communion, right? The sign of her kind of integration into the community of believers because she, they're quarreling. Um, I mean, this turns into another quarrel. Um, and we know about the incident appropriately enough because it gave rise to litigation before an ecclesiastical tribunal. Um, now, culturally, I'd say this is because the church was imagined to be Christ's figurative body, a unity cemented by consumption of what was believed to be Christ's real body, the Eucharist. Mistress Chambers' demand for reconciliation, I think, confirms just how deeply demands for amicable, non-litigious dispute resolution penetrated late medieval minds. Without forgiveness, one might say, Christ's body was not whole. Um, so, right, we can sort of see this kind of ideal spreading outward, sort of, from church courts um, into lay courts and, in fact, into the behavior of believers. Um, but it can always be judicialized, as it is in the case of Mistress Chamber and um, Mistress Carpenter. Now, in this section, I want to turn specifically to the legal kind of texts at the root of excommunication for debt and how this actually happens and then show a few figures. Um, Judges and litigants surely shared the view that church courts existed to encourage charitable relations among Christians. Because the church was Christ's body, sins against the community of believers were sins against God and vice versa. This is the rationale for why this is so serious, right? Sort of, if it's Christ's body, well, sort of every kind of breach of charity is a sort of really kind of nasty crime against God. Um, Ecclesiastical tribunals, from the perspective of their personnel, defended God's church, its property, and personnel against the word, world and enforced God's precepts. Um, 
What's interesting here is by about 1500, for crimes from assault to adultery to bigamy, church courts assigned uh, monetary fines, only rarely and with decreasing frequency, adding afflictive punishments such as imprisonment or flogging. Um, excommunication was seldom assigned as the punishment of a case that's gone to final judgment. It's usually um, a kind of procedural sanction, a medicinal punishment encouraging a sinner to abandon his sin, which is disobedience of the church court. Now, it's no Christian particularity to make a point that promises or covenants are to be honored. Um, and here we get to the grounds of how you could enforce a verbal contract with um, excommunication. So we know promises to God were the most important. Um, solemn vows of celibacy um, uh, or vows to perform a certain action in, in thanks for a certain other action um, or, for instance, the promises of faith given by godparents at the baptism of an infant are essentially unbreakable. Um, but even more broadly, promises implicitly or explicitly made before God, um, those secured with oaths on the Gospels or relics or invoking the name of God, um, were to be violated only with great trepidation. Um, church courts certainly enforced these, but they also enforced um, simple agreements without oaths, without swearing on relics, without kind of any formal invoking of the name of God. Um, in Gratian's Decretum, this kind of great teaching text of the millennium, we find one of the canons that says, the Lord wishes there to be no distinction between our promise and our solemn oath. So between our word and a kind of um, formal covenant. Uh, in a slightly later medieval canonical collection, we find this passage in a chapter um, on contracts. Either contracts once entered into should be observed, or an agreement, if the contracting party does not observe it, should be enforced through ecclesiastical sanctions. All have said, let peace be preserved, let contracts be observed. Um, this, by the way, is the root of the Grotius and international law idea that pacta sunt servanda, that kind of conventions are to be observed in international law. Now, of this last passage, the canonist who became Pope Innocent IV wrote, the breaker of a contractual obligation shall be excommunicated. Um, a 15th century successor to this canonist wrote of the same place, contractual obligations, however informal, are to be observed. Otherwise, an ecclesiastical judge shall provide a remedy to the observer of an obligation against the non-observer. The procedure of church courts put these principles into operation excommunicating those denounced as breakers of promises. Um, now I'll just give a couple of examples of this from my research, pursued to my conclusions, and maybe we can talk a little bit about this and go back to religion in the public square. So, in 1427, in the parish of saint germain l'Auxerrois in Paris, um, the summoner and keeper of the Archdeacon's Register of Excommunicates recorded that um, a man named Philibert Delorme had been excommunicated just after Easter for debt. Um, not long after, another woman was excommunicated um, for contumacy, for failure to heed the command of a church court. Uh, the register isn't very um, kind of specific in this point. The second excommunication may also have come in a case of debt. She may have been summoned to court and didn't show up. Um, the good thing is that you could sometimes pay a summoner to sort of whisper the summons into his elbow. And so once the person summoned doesn't know about it, obviously the term will pass and the person's excommunicated. Um, these were two out of 157 excommunicates that year um, in the Archdeaconry of Paris, a uh, jurisdiction that covered about half of the city and part of the Diocese of Paris. In another example, more specifically in 1500, in a parish in Lower Normandy, um, where the prelate in charge is a woman, by the way, this is an abbess with an exempt jurisdiction, um, a man named Guillaume Letelier was excommunicated for a debt of 12 sous, 6 deniers, to Martine, widow of the late Guillaume Le Duc, on the Wednesday before Palm Sunday. Here I just say that everyone in this period usually took communion once a year at Easter, so the best time to excommunicate someone is right before Easter. So there's sort of a spike in excommunications during Lent. Um, these people are, even if they're good believers, are using this in a very calculated sense. Uh, another man was excommunicated for a debt of um, only four sous, four deniers. So how much is this worth? Well, one sou was about the daily wage of a rural laborer in Lower Normandy in this period. So the first sum was probably for six to nine hundred dollars, right? Depending on how generously we're going to pay our wage slaves. 
Um, and the second one, probably something like two or three hundred dollars. Um, in that jurisdiction that year, 200 people were excommunicated. Um, so, as I said before, um, there, there are kind of two paths here to this. There's failure to comply with a citation, respond to a summons, uh, or failure to honor a contract. And then you're sort of denounced, procedures set in motion, and you can be excommunicated. Most citations were probably delivered verbally. Um, very few of them survive in the record. We only know that they're there because they're a list of people um, right, of, who, who've been excommunicated. Um, and if we believe the worst accusations against summoners, um, apparently they went out with baskets of blank citations and sold them. Um, rather cheaply, actually. This is, a, this is an accusation you come up against um, repeatedly. Um, as to the second path to excommunication, um, defaulting on debts confessed before an ecclesiastical judge, um, these usually come with a verbal warning to pay on pain of excommunication, so it's fairly clear what happens there. Um, and these usually happen relatively quickly. The intervals are very quickly, within five days, within ten days, something like this, uh, after the initial warning. Um, now here we kind of return to the public square at least, because after a year, obdurate excommunicates were liable to prosecution as presumptive heretics. Um, and that's where you get in sanctions from the lay authorities. Imprisonment, death, confiscation of your real property. Um, so, what's interesting is that this must have colored people's experience of Christianity, and I'm going to return to this um, in conclusion very briefly. The only vernacular section of the Mass, remembering most Christians in the Middle Ages don't in fact understand much Latin, um, the only portion of the Mass really intelligible to them would often have resembled a laundry list of warnings to pay and excommunications. Um, technically, you're supposed to teach the prayers and the basic of the faith, but we actually have priests complaining that they have no time left over after reading out the list of people who've been excommunicated. Um, here, I'll try and put a smiling face on it again. Um, we can try and understand this in two ways. Um, Excommunication for debt was certainly a means of coercing compliance with court orders. It was also a means of encouraging debtors to satisfy creditors. Now, what we have to remember in this period, it's a way of encouraging buyers to pay sellers for goods bought on credit, of encouraging sellers to deliver, deliver goods sold on credit, and more broadly, of encouraging charitable relations within the Christian community. It was a means of preserving the trust that underlay all the transactions necessarily conducted on credit in an age when the small denomination specie needed for daily transactions is relatively scarce um, and is also depreciating. So it fulfills an economic function. Um, in a way, we can see it as an example of ecclesiastical judges doing their duty. Uh, the duty I mentioned earlier encapsulated in a 15th century gloss to an English canonical collection. It's the duty of prelates to direct lay and clerical disputants toward amicable, agree amicable agreement rather than to litigation. Um, but it also fulfills this kind of interesting economic function. Um, and it was, it, to be admitted, conciliation on equal terms, as one side was threatened with damnation unless he satisfied his creditor. Okay, sorry, that was quite a lot. Uh, I'd like to conclude by affirming that excommunication for debt was effective. Between 1433 and 1461, 92.5% of those sanctioned by the court of the Abbess of Montevilliers, the one in Normandy I just mentioned, of about 1,500 records or extant of probably 2,500 sanctions, 92.5% um, of those excommunicated are recorded as having been absolved. So somehow they satisfied their creditors. Um, only 60 of the Abbess's subjects, those resident within her territory, or 5% of those excommunicated, are not recorded as having been absolved, um, as against 52 or 25 percent of those who were non-residents. Um, slightly later, between 1499 and 1530, even more, 95.4 percent of over 5,000 excommunicates over that whole period are recorded as having been absolved. So if we break it down again between residents and non-residents, 98.75 percent of the abbess's subjects were absolved. And here I'm probably missing a few because there was a subsequent register. As against 79.3% of non-residents. So 
I think excommunications for debt were certainly um, quite successful at securing the minor credit useful for daily life. Now I get to my two caveats. Um, so first, let's think about the state a little bit. Um, um, uh, you can see a kind of corrosive effect on the state. Um, this has to do with a number of other things, but there really is a sort of corrosion of the public sphere, right? As you assimilate the community of the baptized to the political community, um, this really ought to be sort of terrifying to religious minorities, and I'll make the case also to the religious majority. Um, because what's quite apparent looking at this history, what if the state dissolves? Litigants can vote with their feet, as they did in the high Middle Ages. They can go to church courts, and it will be a long struggle over the whole early modern period for states to kind of claim some of this jurisdiction back. Um, so, sure, litigants can take their cases to religious courts. At what price to the state's justice? At what price to religious minorities? Now for the church, for the religious institution. The unspoken endpoint of this story that I've told rather poorly because I've tried to cut some sections out, the unspoken endpoint of the history of excommunication for debt is the, um, the 16th century, the age of reformations, the Protestant, the Catholic, in which Western, um, the Western church broke apart um, <laughs> irremediably, I would say probably, um, and all varieties of rest Western Christianity were transformed. Um, even in Catholic countries, um, church courts were a pale shadows of their former selves after this period, as they are today, I would add. Uh, excommunication for debt virtually disappeared. Um, now, I mention this because it's quite clear that the attitude evident in the Reformation has something to do with it. So to take an example, at Purton in the Diocese of Lincoln in England around 1446, uh, 12 men forced the summoner and his clerk to eat the writ of excommunication they were about to serve. Uh, they sometimes kill summoners, so I'd rather eat my writ. Uh, since it's probably a small thing, it's okay. Um, for which most of them were appropriately excommunicated. Um, now, thinking from their perspective, as such men likely still sought salvation, and sought salvation within the church through its sacraments, their attitude to the institutional church must have been complex, I think, to say the least. Um, these sanctions, designed to promote reverence for the church's precepts and jurisdiction, could as well fissure as unify the sacramental community. We know that creditors, by the way, accused debtors um, of witchcraft, and debtors likewise accused creditors of witchcraft. Um, particularly ugly version of this. Um, the use of judicial sanctions and extrajudicial disputes, this habit of encouraging conciliation through threats of damnation, could be corrosive, also on the religious institution. Such practices certainly distanced believers from the institutional church in the centuries before the Reformation, even as they still sought salvation through it, and certainly also encouraged radically new visions of uh, the community of believers. Um, so I think religious institutions should engage in this sort of thing with considerable discretion, and the state should um, permit it or engage in it only with equally considerable discretion. Um, I hope you're, that these examples sort of at least raise the question, or raise some reasons why, and thank you for your attention to some sort of long historical meanderings. Thank you.